Mac Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday is a special um, Thanksgiving Day episode. What is it? That's what they call it in Britannia, isn't it, Pedro? <laughs> Might as well be. It's like, uh, oh yeah, all of them people that speak with an accent similar to mine have left the country, and then I came back. <laughs> <laughs> he does that, man. He comes back each and every week, along with Jill Bryant. Hey, what's going on, Jill? Hi. Hi, hello, everyone. Well, I'm in progress of rewiring my broadcasting computer and replacing an old UPS whose battery died with a new one. So just in case we have some brownouts here in the summertime, I won't have issues. <laughs> oh, man, it's L.A. in California. No brownouts. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's a solid power grid if I've ever... I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, man. <laughs> I've been up to a lot, if you're wondering. Uh, we're going to talk about some Linux stuff in a hot second. We're, we're just mm -hmm. kind of catching up. Uh, we were talking about some stuff in the pre-shows. and um, Yeah, mm -hmm. Jitsi. Having fun with that. I'm, mm -hmm. Jordan's deploying uh, Jotunheim, which we, we're working. That's what we're using right now is Jitsi. We're not using Jotunheim just yet. And I've uh, started uh, deployment on Steppenwolf. So it's... Uh, not a duplication of efforts. It is a friendly it's competition. It's a competition. <laughs> <laughs> Incentive. It's going to be fun times and good times, but we are going to get into some of the Linuxy things that we found interesting that have happened since last Wednesday. Starting off with that nonsense um, is um, we got to make a correction, Pedro. Ooh, yes, we do. <laughs> we kind of got it completely wrong last week. We did. Uh, Hamburger correction menu is what I want to call it. They're not getting rid of the hamburger menu. We're talking about GNOME and, you know, this uh, stupid monkey little thing over here. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're going to try to make it useful again. They're, they're going to be adding. So if reading this correctly, which this is not the most straightforward thing in the world, is uh, they're going to be taking what the application menu stuff and cramming it back down in there. Yep, because uh, GNOME was doing the macOS thing where it would give you like a teeny tiny menu on the top panel that that's where you saw the uh, application menus. Well, uh, they're moving it back or moving it into the hamburger menu, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> kind of liked uh, the, when I first read it, it's like, oh, they're actually separating the menus now into instead of having the menu all laid out, you get... Um, separate hamburger menus each for its own thing and i really like that idea this ah this not so much i don't i don't have anything yeah. against this i uh who was it uh leo uh, sort of note he's like hey yo did mm -hmm. you read that and i was like i read it and i reread it and i was like ah right so i just wanted to get that right uh but leo did point out uh the reason that all three of us misunderstood this is because we all possess blind hatred for the gnome project <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> so just just keep that in mind even though yeah. we were praising gnome last week for doing something <laughs> but let's get into the business Susie. oh this is a big one a 2.5 awesome. billion dollar big one so uh yeah suzy has been bought again this time microfocus as sold it to um uh who did they sell it to Let's see. Swedish Private, Swedish Private Equity, Equity, Group. Equity Group. Okay. It's just that. I thought it had a name proper, but it doesn't. Uh, so it's, yeah, no, uh, they sold it to the Swedish Private Equity Group, and it's uh, a $2.5 billion purchase for the Suzy, which, um, uh, who was it, uh, Mike G, in the uh, comments of the show notes, actually brought up a very good point, which is <laughs> anything that's not Microsoft, just Yes. <laughs> Anything that's not Microsoft, because we uh, that was one of the long running jokes in the Linux community that, yeah, Suzy <laughs> was bought by Microsoft. So it's just terrible as an operating system. And then Microsoft goes and buys GitHub. And nowadays everyone's going like, oh, God, Microsoft is taking over. So it's good to see that something that isn't owned by Microsoft is uh, still around. And uh, hey, we'll see what the Swedish do with it. I didn't think for one second Microsoft was going to buy Suzy, um, but here it is. I mean, it's changed yeah. hands. It's a different thing, but everything's going to stay the same, right? Uh, yes. In fact, um, I was actually, I was really happy to hear that, that the Swedish equ uh, private equity group is um, 
still going to allow them to do business as usual, and that Seuss is extremely pleased and positive about its new acquisition. This is awesome because um, also that Suse is committed to supporting the open Suse community who plays a key role in Suse's success. They have a very unique relationship in the in industry and uh, with Suse Linux enterprise drawing innovation and changes to its software and infrastructure from the open Suse project. And that's just, that's wonderful. It's, it's, it's the only distribution in uh, one of the only ones in the industry that does that. And um, what's really cool is this news comes at the heels of the new release of SLES 15, which is mm -hmm. much more modular, uses one code base, and only has one installer. So users can install what they require for their workload without having to install different versions of SLES. Right. So that's very innovative. <laughs> it's good news. And it's uh, Susie. You basically, you're going to run into it in the enterprise, and there's a few dedicated psychopaths that I know that I run it as a desktop, and you go, oh, okay. Hi, Mayor. How you doing? Um, <laughs> I yeah, and, never yeah. had a chance to, I mean, I've played around with Susie way back, when, we're talking like probably 18 years ago. That was my last experience with it. Nothing against it. It's just never seemed like a very, uh, it didn't offer me anything on the desktop. Um, oh, Yeah. I, I use it in uh, two of my uh, render farm servers for mm -hmm. rendering animation, and it works quite beautifully. And um, yeah, Patrick mentioned in in chat also uh, that that the biggest difference that he's going to see is we're going to have to change names and passwords with our accounts. <laughs> <laughs> so so at least they're going to keep business as usual, and that's the important thing. That is good and to know. It's one of the things that Susie does that uh, I will commend to the rest of my days is uh obs no not that one the other one uh <laughs> and yeah it's uh it's a really good hosting system slash build system slash everything else it does what it's supposed to do and it supports other distros not just Susie. so that's it's good mm -hmm. keep on it <laughs> Right on, right on. Let's keep on with it. Linux Foundation, um, Platinum Chrome, man. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Google becomes Platinum member of Linux Foundation, demonstrating its commitment to the open source community. Uh, this is a big deal. Um, also because IBM, Intel, Oracle, Qualcomm, Microsoft, and VMware are already Platinum members. And Google knows that open containers are growing exponentially and are the future to almost every business. And GitLab is moving to Google K Kubernetes and GitHub has been bought by Microsoft. I am sure, very sure that this is an impetus for Google to double down on its commitment to open source. And putting someone on the board of directors at the Linux Foundation is just the ticket. <laughs> well, here's the thing. I mean, yeah. Google got rid of do no evil, but it turns out you can buy a lot of goodwill in the community for $270,000 a year. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I actually thought the uh, platinum membership, wasn't it uh, half a million a year at one point? They had coupons, all right? All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, apparently that's changed because I checked the Linux Foundation website. So, oh, no, it's 200, uh, 270000 a year. Okay. So um, my question is, considering that Google announced not too long ago that they were developing a completely new operating system that's not Linux-based called Fuchsia. For, for Chromebooks Fuchsia? and Android. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is this uh, guilt money? Nope. Is this? No, no I, I, I don't see the connection there because the whole Fuchsia <laughs> thing is uh, there. There, it's called Project Dynafire Oracle. Quit trying to sue us. Sure. Yes. Uh, it's also called Project Having to Pay Royalties because of uh, Microsoft patents to Android. Yeah, the the file system patent is still very much there. <laughs> so I, I say good on them it's definitely a good way to you know endear yourself and it's a good way to get on the mm -hmm. board too um yeah yeah <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh. all right so uh speaking of google and linux <laughs> <laughs> happy times here again we get to talk about this about every two weeks because it seems more and more is rolling out linux apps on chrome os Coming to 18 more Chromebooks, this is from The Verge. All of this is going to be in our show notes. Go check that out. 18 more Chromebooks are getting support um, on Chrome OS. Uh, 
It's pretty neat. Uh, laptops based on an, uh, Intel's Apollo Lake architecture. Now mm -hmm. able to run the applications. Uh, there's some more information over at XDA. Of course, there's ways to do this unofficially <laughs> if you want to play around with it. And uh, previously, it was with the Pixel Book and what was it? The Chromebook Plus from Samsung, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> Those were things. However, I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying this. You know, I'm very much on Team Keep Chrome OS, a glorified web browser. I mean, I am, simply <laughs> because, here's the thing. I understand the people like us, absolutely. Myself, Jill, but all of you in the mm -hmm. audience, like, yeah, I want this, because I can do more with it, 100%. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a big honking switch where you can cut that feature off. Absolutely, because I look at, like, the... Two people, one in particular that I bought a Chromebook oh. for was an older lady, and I went to go mess around with her computer. She's like, it's slow, and I looked at it, and I was like, you just need to Hendrix this thing with petrol and <laughs> light it up. And I picked her up a Chromebook. It wasn't an expensive one. It was like 280 bucks. Happy. Yeah. It's like, what do you need? I need the Facebook. I need Skype. Here. Done. Yeah. yeah. Can't do anything to it. Oh, it's broke? Here. Here's how you power wash. Okay, log back into your Google account. Everything's back. Done. Yeah, and that's that is the big selling point of uh, the Chromebooks. But as yeah. uh, one of them uh, people who like to tinker about with Chromebooks, <laughs> and uh, who uh, spent two hundred and fifty pounds on this uh, pretty <laughs> little Acer R eleven, I'm sitting here wondering: Okay, Apollo Lake is all well and good. How about some of that Braswell love? <laughs> because uh, there have been uh, Google have announced that there will be some Chromebooks like the some of the ARM ones and some of the really early Intel ones that will not get Linux X support, uh, Linux support at all. Mm -hmm. And this one is not among that list. So uh, pretty please, Google, get a annoy Acer if you have to. Just, you know, let me have my terminal and uh, my devs, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my my first Samsung uh Atom based Chromebook is not on that list either. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> um but I I actually am looking forward to natively installing dev files on my Chromebook and and that is coming. There's there's I have a, a link posted in our show notes about that. Cuz uh, that that's that is actually a big deal for for us that are the tinkers and the developers and whatnot. <laughs> I like the idea, but if I'm to the point where I have a system that I feel comfortable, I'm going to install Deb Debian package or anything else. Like, why not just put a distribution on it? <laughs> well, yeah, I do well, have Crouton, but have crouton, it would be nice yes. to not have Crouton because yeah. it beeps whenever you reboot. That's annoying. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, again, why, why not just put my Fedora on it and... It still beeps <laughs> when you disable the uh, the OS checker, uh, the bootloader that Google loaded the uh, Chromebooks with. It it beeps. Okay, so you've taken this one apart. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Right? <laughs> you've taken this one apart. I have opened the back lid. Yes. Uh, do you know where the internal speaker's located? <laughs> Uh, it's uh, actually embedded. Uh, I would have to actually cut a, a bit of the uh, the path on the silicon to get it to shut up good yeah <laughs> See, <Chromebook's on. laughs> yeah. yeah no everything oh, is on board in a chromebook that's the annoying bit ram is on board the mmc is on board everything mm. okay supercomputers up next yeah supercomputers so for the first time in a long long time all of the uh, well 2012 it's a long long time internet time uh but uh, mm -hmm. all of the uh top what is it top 100 top 500 uh, supercomputers in the world are running um, Linux. They're all running one manner of Linux or another. Uh, it's a top 500 list, yes. And yeah, every single one. It used to be that Linux was only like 95% or 97%. Now it's 100%. That's, <laughs> that's pretty good. And if we're being honest with ourselves, over the past two and a half decades, Linux has been honed for supercomputers and servers and the whatnot, so it, 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 it'd be stupid not to. I'm kind but of uh, surprised <laughs> that the summit from Oak Ridge, which is uh, one kicking the new teeth, I, mm -hmm. it only cost $200 million. They got it together only. in four yeah. years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How did they do that, Joe? Yeah. Well, um, 
Uh, awesome. Uh, so uh, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, of course, is running on Summit, and it's powered by boards running with two 22-core IBM Power9 CPUs and six oh, NVIDIA God. Tesla V100 GPUs. According to NVIDIA, 95% of the Summit's peak performance, 187 .7 petaflops is derived from the system's 27,686 GPUs. And actually, this is this marks the first time GPU performance has overcame the CPU and supercomputer com performance. And um, as for it being less expensive, well, actually, in this case, the GPUs are cheaper <laughs> than, the, than the CPUs and the motherboards combined. <laughs> Because power is expensive. Well, yeah. power nine. And that's what we're going to be seeing in the future, man. I mean, it's all going to be GPU yeah. clusters. So. Yeah. It's so much faster at rendering and, and processing. Uh, and, and I guess that speaks to uh, NVIDIA's Volta architecture, which uh, we've all seen what it can do, even though they clearly said that the, uh, oh, yeah, the Titan V is not a uh, gaming video card. Yeah, but it's beating every other video card out on the market right now. Sure, it costs yeah. three thousand dollars, but it's beating everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, Nvidia is going to release the new whatever. I, I, I didn't check the paper this morning. I don't know what the, what the new released rumor is, but uh, Brave New World, Brave New Browser, Brave as a browser, and uh, you see, Pedro, browsers are like ogres. Mm -hmm. They got onion layers or something like that. Uh, <laughs> and all of them make yeah. you cry. Some, something about a parfait, man. I forget. Uh, <laughs> onion routing is the way to go. It's all about layers of encryption. Brave. It is a browser and that is um, focused on privacy. I took it for a spin. It's available for Linux. And I, I wanted to see what it was all about. Basically, if you're going to get this up and running on a modern Linux distribution, step one, install curl. Step two, go, whoa, this thing's 428 megabytes. It is, and uh, it does work. I tried it. Uh, we're looking at the image here. It's this thing's based on Chromium, right? Uh, it is Correct. using some manner of blink, yes. Okay, yeah. you could do a new mm -hmm. private tab with Tor, and it worked. I didn't hammer on it, I went to the Reddits, I went to the slash dot, and it wasn't painfully slow, but it was uh, mm -hmm. you remember like 2G internet? Mm hmm. Somewhere yeah. around there, but that is the big new thing in this feature. It is there for you to try. Um, Tor's neat. Yeah. I understand mm -hmm. it for security. Um, I, I I just don't have the, like, I have plenty of paranoia that online stuff's never been won. Yeah, and uh, there is another paranoia, especially if you live in the United States, which is you open up the Tor browser and the... Uh, some manner of alphabet agency gets a bit of a red flag. He's like, yep, there's no. a tour. Why, why would <laughs> they need the red flag? They probably have <laughs> own half the exit nodes, man. Um, probably. Or at least but, running uh, yeah, but it's, yeah, uh, yeah Tor, it, it, it has become slower over time, and they actually bring this up in the article, which is, there's a lot more people using Tor nowadays on accounts of the whole Facebook thing, and it's like, okay, how do I get my privacy back? And, yo, know, Tor is a thing, and people use Tor, and, well, there are a limited number of nodes, and with those alphabet agencies cracking down on people running those nodes who aren't them, it's going to slow mm -hmm. down even more. So, yeah, that's that's an issue. <laughs> yeah, a lot more people will be on the deep web, <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. searching through sites you can't normally <laughs> <only> see. <laughs> this is a thing. I'm not, I mean, for you basically browsing, yeah. Tour work if you're worried about whatever. I mean, especially if you're like you're in some weird, like can't even say weird country, man. I did you? Hear what, I think it was Uganda started mm -hmm. today with a like five cent um, social media tax, which is, Egypt tried to block Facebook yeah. at one point. Well, you know, it's for your own good, citizen. That's yeah. That that's a sign that you're probably living in a dictatorship. Also, I think another one is like if it says like People's Republic. Anywhere yes. in the country's name, <laughs> bad news. Um, yeah. Google Cloud steps up storage game to court Hollywood. Launches Fox. Yeah. Store. Okay. Google Cloud steps up storage game to court Hollywood. Launches file store. 
And Google Cloud mm. File Store is a wonderful option for movie and animation studios to render computer graphics and be able to store and move those large files efficiently and quickly. With a classic online render farm, you send your files and animations to be rendered via the internet and you get charged for the processing time per gigahertz used. What is unique about Cloud File Store is that it's both an in-house network attached storage server and an online render farm called a Google Cloud Transfer Appliance. And with Google File Store, you are charged per gigabyte. Uh, per gigabyte per month, either 30 cents per gig per month or 20 cents per gig per month, depending on the tier you bought. And that's that's a very unique, actually, in the, the animation farm industry. And you can sign up for the beta program um, for Google Cloud File Store um, on a link I provided in the show notes. And this is actually really, really awesome that you can sign up for the beta program. So animation houses and businesses that need to move large amounts of data using low latency apply. And uh, yeah, I, I know some companies that should be applying to this. <laughs> so that, that that's really awesome. it is a uh, <laughs> nice chunk of cash up front, uh, even without oh, yeah. counting like yes. the <laughs> 20 or 30 cents per gigabyte per month. Uh, you also have yeah. to pay three hundred dollars uh, for a hundred terabytes of storage up front, and if you want it yeah. at a reasonable time, uh, you will have to pay another five hundred dollars on top of that in shipping. <laughs> yeah, it's if you well, do like the yeah. uh, price per gigabyte, <laughs> that sounds low, uh, especially compared to like the typical user grade hard drives. It's uh, it's much lower. It's a hundred terabytes for eight hundred. Um, uh, $800, that's not bad. But uh, it's it's a significant chunk of change once the monthly costs start adding up and you're actually using it to render stuff and you need to get those yeah. rendered files back. Hey, yeah, there, yeah, there's two ways to look at this, two ways to think about this. Yeah. <laughs> First, it's Google, so I'm just going to say, yeah, good luck with that. And when I say good luck with that, good luck talking people into using this service, because, again, it's Google. Give it three years, it's either one, not going to exist, or there's going to be six versions of it. Um, Am yeah, Amazon, it's... Amazon has eaten your lunch on this, Googs. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's way too late to the party, and you're offering... I mean, this is like Google Search Appliance Mark II, man. I was like, have fun. Somebody's going to buy it. It's going to exist. Yeah. But, yeah. And if Google yeah. didn't have such a bad rep with killing off their services that people actually use, well, here's maybe another people would thing. be tempted. Yeah, <laughs> In the it, notes, I do have listed. Yeah. Right yes. there, there's a Medium <laughs> article that blew up this week. And we're talking yeah. an instance for a very large project. And Google... Using its beautiful AI, flagged it for um, basically fraud or something like that with the payments. Have mm -hmm. you ever tried to getting hold of anyone at Google, like a real meat space person? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> so this was a massive yeah. thing with multiple instances, a very large project that was down, fortunately, only for a few hours. But the only way to get a hold to pull up their services was through email and waiting on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that so, was a, a, a though that was a mistake as opposed to Google actually, you know, completely changing the way they run <laughs> run it. So, um, and you know, to for Google, this this is where their money is going to be, you know, in cloud infrastructure, and they know that this is a vertical climb to that, you know, introducing themselves to Hollywood. So, I think this is. Uh, I think they can try. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I yeah. think Amazon, AWS has beat them to it, and I also think Microsoft's already beat them to it. I don't know if there's enough room in the market for a third player this late in the well, game. Well, the difference in, again, is that this is also an in-house NAS, and that is unique for animators and animation houses. <laughs> yeah, I also got to balance so. that out with like the legitimate thing of if you're large enough for this service, you're probably doing it in-house. Yeah, you're already doing it yeah, in-house. Yeah. Then you deal yeah. with like the yeah. um, just straight-up paranoia with uh legitimate of anything getting leaked yep so mm, we'll yeah, see and, and these are com companies that have millions of dollars so to them this is a kick in the bucket <laughs> the 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 movie studios and whatnot <laughs> yeah so let's see coming up next we have a uh, humbuntu studio audio handbook this is something they put out it's a nice little guide uh peter up uh they say it was kind enough to donate donate his time and uh, just how to set everything up. 
You're going to be playing with Jack. What type of hardware are you going to need? Can you get away with an old laptop? Do you need new stuff? Is it expensive? Uh, some of the plugins, effects, and all that. What would you record with? The software VTS pro uh, programs, advanced recording with Adore, because, you know, if you're going to be doing doll mm -hmm. work, that's probably what you're going to end up doing. It's going to cover mixing and mastering, how to share your music. And uh, this is written from the perspective of mm -hmm. just like his personal journey going through this. And it was kind of a fun read. It was relatively interesting. Right. And uh, a couple of things in there. I mean, hardware wise, it was like, well, let's see, what does this guy know what he's talking about? And he's like, yeah, use the Euphoria UMC 22. And that's like a baby version of what we use for this show. We use the 404. And mm -hmm. so it's like, oh, he knows what he's talking about because that's a very good interface for the price. And uh, yeah, he does point out, and I think this is very true. A lot of people were thinking, and, you know, it's like, oh, you're going to do a podcast or anything like that. That's all I can speak to because that's what I work on recording. You can get away with a decade old computer. You do not need the latest and greatest. You start throwing video in there, then just poof, make it rain. Start Just start throwing money at problems. Um, the Audacity and Audur, two different animals. But if you're going to be doing multi-track recording, both of them play nice. I would prefer using Ardour. And he does bring up Jack. So, uh, yeah, I've taken the Jack challenge. And uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm offer you a little bit of advice. <laughs> if you're just doing like a podcast or basic audio recording, don't bother with it. I mean, unless you want something to do, you want a little bit of a headache, but... Unless you have a dedicated box just for that audio, mm. just use Pulse Audio. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is, Jack, it's not hard to get up and working. It's kind of fun learning how to patch everything together. But it is temperamental and it is finicky. It wants a box mm -hmm. all to itself. It wants all the cycles. Yeah. It does not want anything else going on or it's, it's mm -hmm. just bad times. I mean, hmm. that are my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I was impressed. Um, uh, Ubuntu Studio comes with a really nice Jack audio configuration tool, and the author Peter Report Pert goes into extreme detail on how to set it, set it up and use it with many of the music programs available for Linux. So I think that's definitely you know he had a had a wiki and has and turned it into a book, and that's that's really nice to have, especially for the musicians out there uh, wanting to use Jack with all the different programs. Mm -hmm. And it uh, it's a good thing that he actually brought up the fact that yes you can use a slightly older laptop, it saves uh, yeah. a lot of musicians, mm -hmm. especially those uh, running on you know a very tight budget, not having to buy a MacBook Pro or something like that. Just you know get a laptop, run Ubuntu Studio, and just follow mm -hmm. the instructions. Very good instructions, by the way. Yes. It's well laid out. Music production yeah. is. Uh, relatively straightforward under Linux. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you're yeah. using it, it's available. Good luck getting somebody who's already bought into the Mac ecosystem over to that, but it is still an option. Coming up next, Sci-5 claims its new open cores. Can beat ARM's power efficient processors? Probably not. Um, they're designing an open and customizable processor based on RISC-V, and uh, they're, they're saying, hey man, uh, more power efficient than arms competing process. I, I just no. Mm -mm. I, I don't. I don't <laughs> believe this for a hot second, Joe. No. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, uh, Foxy and Chat brought this to um, our attention, and um, actually, he uh, wrote us a, a little note here and um, about how how the cores and questions are not CPUs in the regular sense. These are microcontroller CPUs. Use and they mm -hmm. are used in robot with in robots, hard drives, and our graphics cards um, directly, not through an OS. And what the power consumption means is smaller devices without the need for huge batteries. Not to mention, since it's the the Risk V, no custom dev platform is needed. This means faster turnaround and fewer license costs, making cheaper products. And um, I thought that was uh, uh, Foxy stated that well. And he was the one, of course, who brought this to our attention. And he himself did a wonderful YouTube video explaining how the RISC V5 uh, CPU architecture works on a Sci 5 Hi 5 1 Ardu Arduino compatible board with RISC 5 based Freedom e E300 processor. 
So there, yeah, the, <laughs> this uh, we had several layers in this story. <laughs> and, yeah, um, and uh, Foxy brought up an issue <laughs> because it's uh, in the article they mentioned, yeah, it's uh, the current Risk Five board development board that uh, Sci Five has available uh, goes for sixty for a three hundred and twenty megahertz uh, microprocessor, while say. A Raspberry Pi 3B Plus goes for 35, and that has a 1.4 gigahertz quad core ARM64 uh, SOC at 40 ish bucks. So, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, Foxy had an issue because, oh, you're comparing apples yeah. to oranges, and yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the, the architecture is all open, so you don't have to buy the board. Yeah, I don't have to buy the board. But they're offering the uh, option to sell it to me, and it's more expensive than the Raspberry Pi. And guess what, Foxy? There are already uh, ARM SOCs being used as microprocessors in mice, in keyboards, in all manner of appliances. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, and, I'm not, I don't have yeah. anything to say to this until I see some silicon. <laughs> I mean... Yeah. <laughs> Nice to hear. It could be. It could be s s more efficient, but that's a very. Uh, I don't even know. It's it, 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 yeah. it, it's in the future. It's not a thing. It doesn't exist yet. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> doesn't exist yet. Yeah. All right, ladies and, and gentlemen, if you like this cores. nonsense, you can uh, yes. head over to LinuxGameCast.com. Slap that support the shows button. We got Patreons. We got some Amazon affiliate links. We uh, even got a little wish zone. For some stuff. I just changed up our Project Bifrost stuff if you want to go check that out. We got Humble, Libre Pay, and all that fun stuff. But we uh best way to do that is whoa, yeah, that's what I changed up. I forgot to close that. You didn't see anything. <laughs> Patreon.com forward slash Linux game cast. Uh thanks everyone for making this show possible because this show started as a Patreon goal and we met it. So we get to do it each and every week, and it helps finance this nonsense. Thanks, everyone, oh, for yes. doing that. Uh, we got a little segment we like to call Slice of Pie, where we get to talk <laughs> about happy, fun, Yay. embedded <laughs> stuff. Starting out with the Power Pies. Yes, a uh, very uh, interesting-looking Power Pie. The Firefly, as they call it. It's a $200, um, $200 development board. Uh, it's it's one of them typical uh, looking rectangular development boards, similar to the Raspberry Pi. Until you look that wait, is that a hold on a second? Is that a button battery socket? Does ARM needs, <laughs> yeah. uh, does ARM need CMOS now? Really? <laughs> what are you playing at here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the Renegade Elite. It's a single board computer. Uh, it comes with the Rock Chip uh, thirty three ninety nine. It is a very well-performing chip. It comes with uh, some Type-C USB ports. Yes, it does. Uh, it's, um, you can pre-order it right now for a hundred bucks. Uh, but um, if you'd like some accessories on top of that, it's 200 bucks. And the prices, uh, the Libra computer, they say that the retail prices will be slightly higher when it's finally released. So something to look forward to. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I, I kind of get excited every time I see something like this. Then, as yeah. soon as they start hitting three digits, it's like 100. And it's like, nope. Uh, yeah. Again, Raspberry Pi 3. Yeah. Quad core RM64. 40 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Although the, the older version of this is only $35. So that was really cool. <laughs> 35. Uh, the biggest problem with the Raspberry yeah. Pi 3, one, uh, it's uh, gigabit, air quote. Ethernet. <laughs> yeah, it's shared with the USB 3.0. No, nope, so nope, it's wrong. It doesn't have the USB 3.0. It works on the 2.0 bus, mm -hmm. enabling about 300 megabits maximum throughput. Trust me, I've researched yeah. this inside <laughs> out because I was going to try to build uh, our video relay boxes for you and Jordan and Jill on a Pi 3, and that ain't going to mm -hmm. happen. I'm. Mm -hmm. no. yeah. <laughs> That's why they can't have USB 3, because that's the whole of the bandwidth that uh, USB 3 could do. 300 megs. That's it. Well, <laughs> that, I mean, it's going to get more expensive, but for to outside of like, because the Raspberry Pi really fills. Why are you guys talking about Raspberry Pi? Because we want to. It's our show. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, the Pi feels, uh, 
it, you can almost get away with doing something more than an overpowered tinker board, but it's not quite there. I mean, it needs another two gigs mm -hmm. of RAM and yeah. it needs USB three. Yes. And a yeah. uh, separate uh, ethernet bus. <laughs> if you got USB three, you can just throw a dongle adapter on it and be done uh, with it. 3.1. Either way, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's better than 300 megabits. It's like, what? Yeah. Okay, really? It's, well, it's technically a gigabit port jack. I'm like, yeah, all right. However, I'm sure it would support if it was yeah. connected to the right NIC, which it isn't. But yeah, the older one's 35 bucks <laughs> for this. And uh, when do they say the pre orders? It's already on pre order, right? Yep, it is. The pre order yes. is 100. Mm hmm. And the uh, if you want all the accessories, it's two hundred. Two hundred, and they say when this thing comes down for retail, it's going to be about twenty percent higher after the yep. Indiegogo campaign ends. So keep that in mind. All right, let, let's hit like uh, yeah. Nerd Factor X four on this. <laughs> Yay! <Ooh. laughs> Playing badass Acorn Archimedes games on a Raspberry Pi, and all you need is a free SD card for the Raspberry Pi, and you can risk OS all the things. This is awesome because the the Acorn um, Archimedes is where the ARM processor was introduced, otherwise known as the Acorn Risk Machine processor, and uh, that makes this this computer uh, very special. And why not use your Ras Raspi's ARM processor to run the operating system games and apps originally intended for the computer that invented it? No emulation needed and of course that's that's unique in our raspberry pi uh gaming world because you almost always need emulators and so this is mm -hmm. this is really cool and the games and apps are free to download and it's just it's <laughs> it's it's really wonderful to be able to play these games natively on the processor that it was intended for <laughs> makes it yeah. very very special and, and I don't currently... have an Acorn uh, Archimedes oh, computer in my collection, but always wanted one. So this is this is a way that that I can play those games, and I do actually have some of them. I have some of the discs. <laughs> All right, and yeah, that, that was the thing that uh, kind of got me sort of semi curious, which was Risk OS <laughs> Open. And as uh, someone who currently uh, lives in Cambridge, uh, I am I was almost very tempted to uh, just get a shell of a uh, of an old Archimedes and see what I could do to shove a Raspberry Pi in there, run some risk costs open, and they're stupidly expensive. <laughs> Even yeah. just the shells uh, without working innards, very expensive. Hot damn! That, that's what you get <laughs> yeah. when a bunch of hipsters start yeah. playing video games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have the BBC Master Compact on my uh, eBay watch list. And it, you yeah. know, the, the cheapest one is about five hundred dollars. So yeah. but I have lots of BBC micros and I've always wanted this one in my collection. And Pedro, it's special. You, you it's know arm. for a fact that nothing <laughs> good has arm. ever came out of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the entire arm architecture, Stephen Hawking. Uh, <laughs> I know that I think the fact that me and you have both spent time there completely negates and like wipes out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We bal We are the karmic balance. Okay. Fair. <laughs> Ying to yang. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, if you want to get in touch with us and uh, like say, hey, you got a lot of stuff wrong. Like, uh, who was it? Leo did, which is great because mm -hmm. we're basically just you with cameras in front of us going, all right, this is what we find interesting. We don't pretend to be experts about anything. You can do that by heading over to LinuxGameCast.com. we got a contact button. You can always leave uh, messages on YouTube videos, but there's no guarantee if you leave a comment because uh, like we all check the YouTube mm -hmm. page and it doesn't have like individual comment counters and notifications for us. Yeah. <laughs> so, But if you do leave a comment on the video on Patreon, we will definitely get back to you unless you're like, don't get back to me. I just wanted to write something. We'll respect that. Uh, coming up <laughs> first... <laughs> This week is uh, from uh, Cameron. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'll go ahead and, and read this one. Okay. Linux, uh, it, um, actually, this is referring to our feedback question from Joe last week, where mm -hmm. he asked the question, is there a single thing, things that would both advance Linux as a whole while spreading adoption overnight? And this is the response from Cameron. Linux and the future. This is the easiest thing to answer. 
What do Mac and Windows have that Linux doesn't? Standardization. No matter how good <laughs> Linux is, not invented here syndrome will not allow the components to unify and get standardized. Why do we have 59 display managers, 27 app SDKs, six different package managers, 14 init systems, 69 window managers? How do we regularly how do regular people use Linux if it is constantly in a state of flux? It's it's fun, but we need to unify. There needs to be a Linux standards body and and can accept a vote for the standardized components a la Bluetooth, Sieg, or Kronos. And uh, uh, boy, um, I my response to this is if you very to true, Cameron. Good point. But in unifying. <laughs> Linux in this way means that the whole concept of open source and innovation is device null and we lose our freedom of choice. And Ubuntu is the most widely known and used distro and Canonical has done a great job in unifying and marketing its ecosystem. And if an individual company, like for say Google, actually uses the word Linux in its Chrome OS and Android operating systems would go a long way to educating the general public about Linux. And having Vulkan standardize among all the operating system is a win. Operating systems is a win-win because you still have the freedom to choose what distro it runs on. <laughs> so uh, basically, what Cameron here is advocating is limiting people's choices. Get away, uh, do away with analysis paralysis, and just yeah. say to a regular human being that you meet out on the street, "Yes, you can use Linux. It's." a thing it's an operating system you can buy oh but what's this about distributions don't worry about it just use it uh that <laughs> would be in his uh, uh in his words uh the ideal scenario yeah that wouldn't change anything cameron uh because <laughs> the thing that keeps people away from linux is not that uh fragmentation it's not it may keep some developers who don't know any better it may keep them away because they don't want to bother it's it's mostly software developers that is exactly the problem is software developers not wanting to support the platform and i'm sure if there was a significant enough claim this like oh there is a problem there is a significant problem with linux and developers not being able to target it accordingly well, mm -hmm. do what Google did. Find yourself a distribution, own it to what you want it to do, specifically for your use case or the use case that you are trying to sell, and sell that. Use that. That is your standardization. That's the thing that Linux lets you do. It lets you standardize on whatever you want. Here's yeah. the thing, ladies That's and gentlemen, boys and girls, <laughs> at the end of the day, this <laughs> is a Windows-like user typing detected. So... Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the type of stuff you type when you're on Windows, and Linux is the big bad boogeyman. It scares you. It confuses you. Choice, options, they terrify yeah. you. You don't know what to do <laughs> with them. They're all in your face. You need it lined up. So you end up with a Macintosh. Do you want Linux to be a Mac? Because that's basically what you're asking. You want that Unix underpinning with a lockstep that you see in Redmond. We mm -hmm. don't, that's not going to happen. That's never going to happen. And the fragmentation with Linux is a good thing. It doesn't prevent one app from running to next. We have snaps. We have app images. We have flat packs. We have solutions mm -hmm. to these problems exactly. that are rolling out. So I don't think it's going to be an issue. But don't worry. The big bad penguin won't scare you for long. Just snuggle up to it. Maybe it'll become a friend <laughs> yes. of yours in the future. <laughs> up next. Uh, up next, we have uh, Debesh. And, uh, well... Uh, he, too, has been reading about the FileZilla debacle, and he says, After the FileZilla fiasco, I'm no longer comfortable using it. While this paranoia may be unfounded, I find it better to err on the side of caution. What do you use? Well, uh, every single desktop environment has a pretty sane default file manager nowadays that handles FTP and SFTP without even breaking a sweat. Mm -hmm. That's what I use. <laughs> yeah, and I use... Uh, I've used... GFTP in the past, and it looks a lot like FileZilla. And I actually um, included a link to an article on um, some, some of the best Linux F FTP clients available. But honestly, today, I just use the FTP command line program to transfer files. Um, I nope. find it quick and easy. <laughs> and I also uh, put an article on that in the show notes on, on how to do that. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, the CLI scares some people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and since uh, he was using, uh, since they were using FileZilla, it is, chances are they want the, um, 
the GUI. Just use your yeah. distros yeah. file manager. Yeah, somebody the file managers are to, great for that. <laughs> like manage a lot of FTP stuff. Uh, file, FileZilla was definitely good when you need to set up a multiple different scenarios with upload ratios, how you need to log in to different sites, and you need to keep that organized. So... I understand that GFTP, it's great. I mean, if you want to experience what computing was like in the 90s, because yes. I think that was the <laughs> last true. time it yes. was updated. <laughs> now, FileZilla is not something you sh should worry about on Linux, but in the spirit with the developer, how he came back and it's just way too dodgy for my taste. I uninstalled it. I didn't use it a lot because I'm not a heavy user of FTP. CLI is great if you need to boop around a couple of files. If you're looking for something, Pedro makes a good point. I know... Uh, you know, with Dolphin or anything like that. I'm using Thunar's built-in SFTP. It supports it. You just type in SFTP, boom, and uh, it integrates nicely. Don't have an issue with it whatsoever. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a ton of clients, and Jill's got a nice little list of them linked in the notes. So you will be able to put that in your face organ. Yes. So <laughs> I think despite the <laughs> reality's best efforts, we managed to pull off 125th <laughs> yes. Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday. So, yes. ladies and gentlemen, let's roll those well deserved credits. Credits. Yay. <laughs> Looks like the fireworks outside managed to uh, spark a different kind of fire. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Poor Ben has his work cut out See, for this him is, today. This I'm is so why no one ever needs to be like around <laughs> me physically. When we're doing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank everyone for making this possible, sticking with us. If, yeah. if you're watching uh, after the fact, go go back and watch the uncut version. I'm sure it's hilarious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the lack of continuity and is. Uh... <laughs> yes, and honestly, in this last that last segment, the audio for both you guys was coming in and out for me, so I wasn't completely hearing you. <laughs> You sounded fine, so I have a little sound. That's why I decided to take that, that, that 